Hey, welcome everybody. It's uh, I'm Dave Bandrowski here at Daring Live. Glad y'all could all make it, and uh, it's good to be back here. We missed a missed a couple weeks as we were off at a couple festivals. Um, we were at Merle Fest, and we had another team at at Winfield, the Winfield Festival. And it was great to see friends and and faces in person again, and uh, hear some music, uh, live music. And uh, I want to give a shout out to a couple. A couple of viewers, regular viewers that we saw at Merlefest is uh, Brian Smedley and Mike Lee. It's great to great to hang out with you there. Um, well, today we have a great show. We have we have uh, Bill Evans is on the show. Uh, he's an internationally recognized five string banjo force. He's a performer, a teacher, a writer, a composer. He shares a deep knowledge and intense virtuosity and contagious passion to all things banjo. Uh, he has a career that now spans over 35 years, and he has shared this knowledge with thousands of music fans and banjo students from all over the world. Today is here to share with all of y'all in on Deering Live. So, without further ado, Bill, how you doing? Hi, everybody. Thanks, David. We'll start with the tune here. How about that? That'd be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That was fantastic. What was that? Those were a couple of songs from a record that was released 20 years ago this month. Uh, the project is called Bill Evans Plays Banjo. You know, there's a jazz piano player that has my name and a living jazz saxophone player and uh, a bass player. Many folks share my name. So um, I titled it Bill Evans Plays Banjo 20 years ago. And you, know, you can listen to it on iTunes and YouTube and all those things. But there are two tunes from that record. Um, the first was called Leaving Owensboro, Kentucky. At that point in my life, uh, I was relocating from Owensboro back to the West Coast. And uh, the second one was a tune called Catching the Dickens, which was written after an, uh, a mostly all-night jam with Hazel Dickens, Alice Gerard and Mike Seeger uh, at IBMA. And salute to everybody who might be at IBMA this week or watching some of the IBMA uh, remotely. So. Fantastic tunes. It's, it's funny that you brought that up, brought up the Bill Evans uh, pianist and, and saxophone player. That was one of my first, first, first final questions to clarify that you are the banjo, Bill Evans, the banjo player. And, and I probably need pianist. to rewrite my bio materials because really I've been at it now for 45 years. 
<laughs> rather than 35, even longer than that. If you count uh, gigs I played in high school and teaching students while I was in high school. So I turned 65 this year. So, and I started playing when I was, uh, well, I started playing piano when I was four, guitar when I was eight and banjo when I was 12. So, wow. so I've been, that's, you know, been playing mo- almost all my life here. You've been at it. Yeah. So, so you grew, did you grow up, did I read correctly, you grew up in Virginia? I did. I was born and raised in Norfolk, Virginia, and had the, um, the very good uh, uh, blessing, I'll call it, because it's not really luck, uh, but there was a folk music store in Norfolk, Virginia called Ramblin' Conrad's Guitar Shop and Folklore Center. You know, back in the 60s and 70s, folks used to call their, folk, their guitar stores folklore centers. And, uh, and Oak Publications was a mighty force in publishing. And as a high school kid, I could go in there and play all kinds of records. I was introduced to many artists that I'd never heard of. And there was a very supportive community of older musicians who played blues and old time music. And, and they also were part of the Old Dominion Folk Festival. And I got to hear Libba Cotton when I was in high school. As a matter of fact, um, uh, I helped her get from one place to another uh, uh, for a full day. I met Tracy Schwartz of the New Lost City Ramblers, Mike Seeger. And for a high school kid, this was just really a great exposure to some of the icons of the music. And then also understand that it's not all about bluegrass. I got interested in the banjo because of Flatt and Scruggs once I, once I figured out who was playing that incredible banjo music. But uh, my experience growing up in Norfolk uh, exposed me to all kinds of American traditional music on the African-American side and the Anglo-American side. And then I went to college at the University of Virginia, which uh, if you're old enough to remember the Waltons TV show, we're right, uh, Charlottesville is right up against the Blue Ridge Mountains. The Blue Ridge Mountains are about 20 miles west. And, and uh, there was a community of old time players there as well, older folks than me coming in at 18 years old as a first year uh, college student. And there were also bluegrass musicians there too and bluegrass festivals. And and uh, by the time I started college, I was already hooked on the banjo, however, but I got a chance to hear groups like the Country Gentleman and the Seldom Scene and, and, and the various bands that passed through Charlottesville as well. And then graduated in 1978 and uh, after um, attending my graduation ceremonies with uh, a, a speech by U.S. Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, I hit the road and went to Stumptown, West Virginia, at where I started uh, a whole summer's worth of freelancing with a band from Louisville, Kentucky called the Falls City Ramblers. And they played a little bit of everything, including Hawaiian music. So I took up the dobro to kind of keep track of those Hawaiian tunes. But it was during that summer that uh, we played many of the you know major festivals run by a man named Jim Clark, and he was attracting audiences, uh, broad-based audiences. These weren't just traditional bluegrass festivals. However, I got to spend time with Bill Monroe, Charlie Moore, Ralph Stanley. J.D. Crow at that time had uh, Keith Whitley in the band and Jimmy Goodrow. I met J.D. at that time, Butch Robbins, many, many musicians. Uh, and again, tremendous exposure uh, to see these musicians live and, and talk to them. And I had already pretty much determined, actually I determined to be a professional musician on February 8th, 1964. What's so special about that date? Well, that's when the Beatles played Ed Sullivan. And I knew that I wanted to be a musician when I went to school on the Monday, Ed Sullivan was on a Sunday. I felt like life had changed, uh, but it took me a while as a second grader to figure out what kind of music to play. <laughs> <laughs> So brief biography and you know, based yeah. out of Charlottesville for a long time uh, and had a band. Uh, I was a co-founder of a band called Cloud Valley that included two musicians who are still very much on the scene. And if you count me, maybe three. But uh, the bass player in that band was Missy Rains. And yeah. uh, and the mandolin player it now lives in New Mexico. His name is Steve Smith. And he has been performing for the last decade or more with the group called the Hard Road Trio. And actually, I was at Winfield a weekend before last performing with Steve Smith and Tim May. And that group uh, was popular in Virginia from 1981 to 1985. And during those years, we made friendships with folks like um, in the bands, Tony Trishkin Skyline, Country Gazette with Alan Mundy. Uh, we ran a concert series in Charlottesville and we tried to get as many people in town as possible. So we had everybody from Peter Rowan and Vassar Clements to Hot Rise 
to uh, Larry Sparks. And uh, again, that was another way to get to know um, these musicians and, and establish these relationships, many of which are still really important to me today. Uh, Tony Trish and Alan Mundy, they're my mentors, but I can also count them as good friends, I hope. So, and then I, while I'm on this kick, let me just power through here, David. Now, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we won't like abandon, everyone will abandon us, but, but you know, that group, had it its course. Uh, our last gig was at Winfield and Byron Berline played with us for our last set. Mm. And then I decided to go to um, graduate school in music at the University of California, Berkeley, relocated all the way across the country from Virginia. And I have a master's degree in music with a specialization in ethnomusicology and American music history. And I took all the coursework for the PhD, but I didn't go any further than that. And then after that, I spent some time in Owensboro, Kentucky as the associate director of the International Bluegrass Music Museum. And then in 1997, long time ago, I moved back to California and I've been making my living as a workshop leader, band member, uh, recording artist when I can get into a studio since that time. And I relocated to New Mexico two years ago. So I now live near a beautiful town called Ruidoso. We're at 7,000 feet, but we're only about, oh, two and a half hours from the Mexican border. But we are up there and we have winter. So we're already burning our pellet stoves and wearing jackets. And uh, last year, we our biggest, one of our biggest snowstorms occurred in October. So, so the signs of fall and winter are everywhere here in New Mexico. <laughs> well, uh, that's, uh, you had quite exposure to, you know, some greats as you're developing as a, as a young musician. How do you think that uh, that influenced you and helped improve you as a musician that, you know, to help you become the musician you are today? Great question. Um, I I'll tell you what happened during the Cloud Valley years. We figured out that if we invited these bands on a Sunday or Monday night to play in Charlottesville, maybe after they had played the Birchmere in Washington or played a major festival in North Carolina over the weekend, that they oftentimes would stay with us for a couple of days. So we tried to book people on Sunday or Monday, and I've had everybody sleep in the house that I lived in at that point in time as a guest. And that was a tremendous opportunity to pick up pointers from people like Tony Trishkin, Alan Mundy. Bill Keith came down to teach workshops quite a bit. He wasn't in a band, of course, at that time. And, and so that was important. I think, um, you know, I know a lot of younger people are, you know, might be watching this. I certainly hope so. And, and I'll just make one point that I think, you know, sometimes uh, a younger person may not realize, but back in the 1970s and the 1980s, there was a tremendous amount of innovation going on in the music then too. We think of today as being an exciting time. That was an exciting time for me back in the 1970s and 80s, whether it was the seldom seen, um, which was kind of an outgrowth of the country gentlemen. The country gentlemen themselves were seen as a progressive band. But then along came Tony Trishkin's Skyline and Country Gazette, and then the Newgrass Revival, first with Courtney Johnson playing with Sam Bush and then later Bela Fleck. Got to see that version of the Newgrass Revival quite a bit. We opened for them many times. And boy, what an exciting time on, you know, with, with um, a group of musicians that were pushing boundaries forward. And then there were some awesome traditional bands, too, of young musicians. And the Johnson Mountain Boys stand out among those, uh, uh, in my mind, most of all. But Larry Sparks was awesome. He still is, but he was just as awesome, maybe even a little awesomer back then. Uh, Dave Evans was another performer uh, on the traditional end that we all loved. And, and so, um, you know, I think that maybe... Uh, Depending upon our age, we we each of us, depending upon our formative experiences when we you know first get into this music, might latch on to a particular time period. And I guess my time period would be the 70s and the 80s with those bands. Um, another person that was very kind to me that I got to know was Ben Eldridge of The Seldom Scene. And we would drive up from Charlottesville to go hear them at the Red Fox Inn, this tiny little, little bar in uh, Bethesda, Maryland. And I ended up driving over to his house before the gig and I had transcribed a lot of things from record by Ben Eldridge, the old train album live at the cellar door. And I would show him what I tried, you know, what I'd figured out. And then he would show me how to do it correctly. And, uh, and a lesson learned uh, in that experience was that using my ear, great ear training, learning from records, 
And we had none of the digital resources that we have now where, so I would take a 33 RPM and slow it down to 16, you know, in those days, buying a turntable that had that option. Uh, but I also found that when, when Ben showed me how to do a particular phrase that I tried to learn by ear, I had always worked it out much more difficultly uh, with, with much more like fingering and made it really hard. And then when he showed me, it was easy and it was banjoistic. And, and Alan Mundy also quite the same thing, although Alan plays some incredibly you know, complicated things. Many times when I tried to figure out something that Alan had done, um, I had figured it out in a way that was too difficult. So one thing that these musicians did was showed me how naturally things can lay out on the banjo. Uh, and, uh, and I also took some jazz guitar lessons from a musician named Emily Remler. I would take in Charlottesville. She lived in Charlottesville on a couple of occasions. I would take my banjo in. And her first assignment to me was to uh, play the first couple of minutes, uh, getting as many notes as I could for uh, of a Bill Evans uh, trio performance. And so, you know, she was probably making fun that I had the same name. So I, I <laughs> there was a time in the 1980s where I was uh, doing a lot of work out of jazz exercise books, but I never really learned jazz tunes or or jazz vocabulary or jazz licks. And so the way that translated really in my bluegrass playing was I ended up writing things that, that explored different keys at certain times. So there was a lot of experimentation uh, and, and learning and growing in those years. And just one more thing to wear people out, but much later uh, in the 1990s, when I moved to Owensboro, Kentucky, as part of our mission at the International Bluegrass Music Museum, uh, I worked with J.D. Crow and Sonny Osborne on a couple of projects. I co-produced a homespun video featuring Sonny Osborne, and I co-edited an AccuTab book of J.D. Crow transcriptions. And, and really the only, the only transcription book that I know of where someone actually sat down with J.D. and played, played things for him and got uh, you know eyeball to eyeball with it. And getting to know those guys, Sonny Osborne and J.D. Crow, totally turned my head around. John Hartford also, uh, and it made me look at the return to the more traditional elements of banjo playing, role-based, scrug style. And I realized through you know being friends with J.D. and Sonny that one could play scrug style approaches, and that that is totally fulfilling as well. So a lot of the tunes I started writing around those years, uh, like the first two that I played, were, were based on that idea of trying to capture, um, find my own voice using uh, role-based Scruggs ideas. And it's a never ending journey. You know, I'm now going back and forth and trying to play all kinds of historical styles. And I just simply love the banjo and I love teaching. Well, that's, it's incredible that how you got to uh, um, study some with Emily Remler. Uh, she's fantastic, you know, incredible jazz guitar player for those who don't know and and um, you know the way that the way that a jazz lesson works is that she would say something like joe pass has a guitar book it has an orange cover and she would say well play that first exercise it could take you six months to learn that first exercise <laughs> and you know i've talked to i've talked to ron block and he, uh, about similar ideas and he has worked out of a book called the advancing guitarist which is a wonderful book and then at one point he admitted to me well i never really got past the first couple chapters that was enough <laughs> and those jazz books oh my gosh I worked out of um, one of the books that jazz musicians commonly used in the 1970s and 80s was a book written by Jerry Coker called Patterns for Jazz. And it's all um, it's not interval studies. It's all just one voice. And I basically uh, set a goal for myself to work through that entire book. Uh, and you would see one exercise and it would say simply play in all keys in all positions. And, and then it would give you a metronome very, you know, set. So like 90 to 120 for a quarter note. And it took me four years to work through that book, but I did. Sometimes I would practice those exercises a couple of hours a day. I had more time to practice back then, you know, than I do now or when I had kids or was married. And, and I did work all the way through that for sure. But, but getting into jazz, I learned is what, what a uh, journey that is. That is, that is a lot of work. And, you know, I look at someone like Ryan Cavanaugh and my hat is off to him. I used to try to, you know, see if I could play John Coltrane's solo to Giant Steps back in the 1970s and 80s. Well, he can do it, <laughs> you know, and and play that solo up to speed. That's amazing accomplishment technically. And, you know, when you when you do anything of a technical nature, whether it's you know, Scruggs roll patterns or licks or J.D. Crow licks or melodic patterns or jazz, you're you're expanding your your mind at the same time 
when you, you know, if you, if you work out a scale, E flat scale on the banjo, which we don't actually think of as being a very, very friendly key, but really it is in that it has uh, an open third string and an open four, um, fourth and first if you go to the D. You know, and when you work these things out, you are expanding your knowledge in a lot of ways. Um, but similarly, I love to look at Scruggs transcriptions and Crow transcriptions to to uh, broaden my understanding of that playing. And you know, one of the things I did this year during the shutdown, uh, I have three courses now at Peghead Nation, and I've been one of their um, I was one of their first teachers. And there's a beginning banjo course that's a three finger style, although there are a couple of call hammer lessons. The bluegrass banjo course now has 90 lessons that are all full length uh, for uh, high beginners through advanced on all aspects of bluegrass banjo. And then over the winter, we did a Scruggs, uh, something called Earl Scruggs, a player's guide. And I fashioned this like a college course. So I was putting some of my academic training to use. We used Thomas Goldsmith's book, Earl Scruggs and Foggy Mountain Breakdown. And, um, and we looked at video on YouTube of live uh, Earl Scruggs performances, uh, both on video and audio. And I transcribed 24 pieces and we went through Earl's career uh, Chronologically, starting with Bill Monroe, we had two classes on the Mercury years when Earl Scruggs and Lester Flatt recorded for the Mercury record label. And then a couple of classes on the, uh, on the 1950s, Columbia uh, playing, uh, combining, looking at live cuts with the recording. Charlie Cushman was my guest for one of these shows, as well as Thomas Goldsmith, who wrote our text. I love this course. And it is now available um, as, as a course that someone can take on Peghead Nation. It's, it's about 10 hours of instruction. Uh, and uh, I really I had a great time exploring Earl Scruggs in a deeper way than I ever had before. And more talking, but I'll plug, we're really, really hoping in January to do a similar eight part workshop series that will initially be broadcast live, but then be offered as a course in the spring of 2022 on J.D. Crow. And we are hoping that J.D. Crow will be with us to show us with the banjo in his hand, to show us how he did things. And we're going to, again, cover his complete career from Jimmy Martin to the Kentucky Mountain Boys and all the phases of J.D. Crow in the New South and the Bluegrass Album Band. And hoping, you know, with COVID, there are some restrictions currently as to what we can do um, at the University of Kentucky Oral History Archive, which is where we're going to record these things. But, but we're hoping to have that run in January. I'm very excited about that project. Yeah. And when you, you know, everybody who's listening, when you, when you hear news about that, check out the Peghead Nation uh, webpage for it for more information. That sounds, that sounds incredible. I'm, I, I'm looking forward to, to seeing that. Um, and for those who haven't checked out Peghead Nation, definitely do so. It's a fantastic resource. Bill's, Bill's lessons are, are fantastic and they have, they have claw hammer lessons. They have lessons of other instruments as well. Um, and Wes Corbett is now teaching, uh, as, and Danny Barnes has a course as well. And they've got a pricing structure where you can do one course for 20 or two for 30. So, so, you know, per month and they have annual subscriptions too, but this is where I've really been putting a lot of my energy the last five years and kind of a legacy project for me is my arrangements of things. And again, we've got 90 lessons with, uh, all kind. the next lesson that's coming up in October is going to be, uh, Sammy Sheeler's Ernest T. Grass. And then the next lesson after that will be Bill Emerson's tune, Home of the Red Fox. But we've got Crow transcriptions, um, Bill Keith, just all kinds of things, backup theory and lots of Scruggs and Don Reno and J.D. Crow stuff. Very cool. Well, do you want to play another tune for us? Yeah, let, I brought some other banjos here. And uh, let me, um, one of the things that I got interested in with my graduate work at UC Berkeley in the 1990s was... Um, the topic of banjo history. And again, I was very, very fortunate, those of us who attended these, um, there were a couple of folklorists in the state of Tennessee and they got funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities and other organizations to do an incredible event called the Tennessee Banjo Institute. And there were, I believe three of them. And they gathered together an amazing, amazing collection of players ranging from people, folks that had they brought in from Africa to some of the leading um, 
English players of the late 19th and early 20th century style of banjo called classic banjo. And then Pete Seeger, Bela Fleck, every, every bluegrass player, every old time player that you could think of. And for many of us, we learned so much about banjo history through getting to meet these specialists, people that I had never known before, like Clark Buehling, uh, who is an expert at a 19th century banjo. Uh, and uh, I believe Taj Mahal was there as well. And this coincided with my graduate work in ethnomusicology. The dissertation that I unfortunately never wrote was going to be about the African musical influence in all aspects of American banjo music, from some of the earliest transcriptions we have uh, to the the to to blackface minstrelsy, to classic era, to to you know old time and bluegrass, and tracing that African uh, musical influence and impulse. Um, and so uh, along the way, I've tried my best to to learn some of these these styles. I'm not an expert in any of them, uh, but I do do a show called The Banjo in America. And uh, it's never really been documented before, but there's this wonderful record label uh, from L.A. called Tiki Parlor Recordings. And I we have a DVD CD coming out titled The Banjo in America uh, late this year, maybe early next year, where I perform 19 tunes or medleys on 10 different historical instruments. So this instrument is uh, a replica of a instrument that would have been uh, built by William Boucher or Boucher, a Baltimore, Maryland drum manufacturer uh, who refashioned the drum factory to make banjos. And um, Jim Hartel is a wonderful New York uh, builder of these old 19th century replicas. This banjo is, I believe, is fairly you know close to what Rhiannon Giddens plays quite a bit in concert. And you know the style that these manuals, these these song books written by these white musicians capture, has much. Africanness in the roots of the style, and also relate to what we think of as claw hammer or sometimes called frailing old time banjo. Uh, down picking is another term that that some of us older folks will use to refer to all of these styles. And these minstrel manuals, you know, elucidate a playing technique that is very similar if you've if you've heard old time banjos. But yet, when you explore the melodies that are contained in these half a dozen or so of instructional manuals beginning from 1854 through the 1860s, you'll see a wide variety of music and rhythmic ideas. Um, I'll try to play one of the harder pieces. I am rusty on all of these things these days, but there are, there are, um, there's a piece called Whoop Jamboree in, in one of the early manuals that has some of these cross rhythms and really unusual starts and stops rhythmically. Let me see how I am tuning wise here. You know, the banjo, of course, is fretless in these days. Uh, this is a replica of an instrument that would have been seen in the 1850s. Frets became more common in the 1880s. The advantage of having no frets is that you can play infinitely out of tune, which I will now demonstrate on uh, this tune called Whoop Jamboree. two 
tune that bluegrass players might recognize. Here's the version from 1854 of Devil's Dream, popularized by Bill Keith with Bill Monroe in 1961. In melodic banjo style, here it is in, uh, from a minstrel manual, 1854. <laughs> Fantastic. Did you always, did you start, um, always play a little bit of claw hammer, a little bit of the older styles too, or is that? No. And you know what? I'm going to turn you up because the heat just came on here in the house and it's also raining like crazy here in Rio Doso. Um, so the question was, did I learn to play claw hammer first? Did, did you, have you always played claw hammer or some of the older styles as well as three finger right. or is this a newer, um, or is this something later in your career that you kind of picked up as you dove into the history of the instrument a little more? Well, you know, I, uh, I got interested in playing the banjo by watching Hee Haw. And again, you have to be a certain age to, you know, to even know what I'm talking about. But, you know, for in the age before uh, the Internet and cable TV, there were a lot of interesting things for a young adolescent boy to watch on Hee Haw. And, uh, and including banjos. And they had many segments in the show where they had banjo players. And I heard Roy Clark picking, and, and I knew that that's what I wanted. But when I got the, a banjo for Christmas, uh, I took a community college course in Clawhammer, but I could never really grow fingernails, and no one told me ever to put a pick on. And I just had a hard time playing Clawhammer. So I switched over to bluegrass and, uh, and, and then got totally hooked I worked at the Norfolk Public Library, and that was downtown. And I worked on you know Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, putting everything in order in the nonfiction section. And they had they had records, and I found a Flatt and Scruggs record that had not been checked out in like twenty years. A Flatt and Scruggs Mercury recording. So uh, um, I stole it, and I still have it in my possession. It's the only thing I've ever stolen in my life. I swear. And once I heard um, Earl Scruggs play Foggy Mountain Breakdown, Pike County Breakdown, Roll in My Sweet Baby's Arms, I knew that that's what I wanted. And so I went in that direction, leaving Clawhammer behind. Uh, I tried to do a little bit of Pete Seeger playing. But then I got, I got back into it um, when I went to the uh, Tennessee Banjo Institute and saw minstrel style and was fascinated by the African connection uh, to it. And, and um, you know, one thing that's important to remember is that Banjo type instruments have been in the new world for, you know, since the, the 1600s and earlier. And uh, these days, uh, researchers tend to call something a banjo when it has some kind of body with a skin. And in some, in, of course, some instruments have a gourd body. This, uh, these early factory banjos have a wooden hoop and then a flat fingerboard. And there was a Spanish instrument that would have been known in the Caribbean where Africans were forcibly imported in large numbers first uh, called the vihuela. That was a guitar-like instrument with a flat fingerboard. And so researchers today tend to think of the, the calling something a banjo where we have the gourd body or, and the stretched skin with a neck that has a flat fingerboard. And it's those items together that we call the banjo. That dates back to the 1600s. That goes back a long way. And if we think about... You know, traditional music styles change. Uh, and of course, there were no, no recording technology. Um, and, and the ways of playing the banjo were passed by oral transmission from one musician to the other for a couple of hundred of years before um, these, uh, these white musicians who performed on the banjo decided to, to try to collect and collate some of the tunes that were being played into these manuals. And then, then we have something that seems kind of frozen in time because it's printed music on a page. 
classic banjo, the same idea. That's the written repertoire of the late 1800s and early eight, uh, 1900s and much more complex music in many ways. But the oral traditions that underlie these written traditions always uh, point to the vitality and strength of the tradition. And, and so African banjo styles have been, you know, were vibrant throughout the 20th century in places like North Carolina with Joe Thompson's music. Um, the great musician Gus Cannon, the father of jug band music, uh, worked the riverboats with W.C. Handy. And, and um, he, I, uh, in the research of the dissertation that never got written, I went to uh, the University of Mississippi Oral History Archive and I listened to an interview that Gus Cannon uh, made that I, I hope has been digitized and is available to all with the folklorist David Evans, no relation, in which he demonstrated a number of different styles. He called uh, Clawhammer style the square dance style. And then he played some quite complex finger-picked ragtime music, indicating that that might be what he would have played as a member of W.C. Handy's orchestra on the riverboats going up and down the Mississippi. And then the style that he played with the, his own jug band was even different still. So really, you know, we're talking about hundreds of years of so many different kinds of banjo music and and transmission and exchange between so many different communities, uh, not only black and white, but but uh, influences, you know, from places like New Orleans. And so, um, you know, the history of the banjo is fascinating. And in many ways, it mirrors the story of American music. And, you know, for me, this is an this is right now is an incredibly exciting time because uh, the, the, we're, we're having new conversations about the contributions of African-American musicians historically and in the current day to, to the banjo and the development of the banjo and the development of these styles. And that's, I, that's where it needs to be. You know, we, we, and, and I'm hoping that as we go forward, the new styles that we develop will be, will be enlivened by bringing in all of these traditions and welcoming all people who play the instrument. Yeah, I, I can agree with you. I, and I think people forget also how much influence from African Americans that uh, Bill Monroe was influenced by when creating bluegrass and, and some of that, some of the blues elements of bluegrass and some modern bluegrass i feel has gets lost sometimes some of the edginess of it some of the, the grittiness of it yes um, so yeah i hope i hope you know we definitely get a you know a larger tent of people in you know contributing to the music yes and and you know there certainly is also an african-american influence on finger picking styles and you know doc boggs is a crucial kind of uh, character in in this story the southwest old-time musician and a white musician uh who claimed to have heard african-american uh, church singing as well as blues guitar players and he adopted a playing style and unusual tunings that do have this this connection with his exposure to African-American musical communities in coal mining country and and of course his music is very blues oriented too I think that when we look for these roots in in the innovations of Earl Scruggs, they are there, but but the direct influence is removed a little bit. It, it and Bob Carlin, the great old time player, has been an author has been researching these topics for many decades, and I'd have to check up with him to see what new things he's discovered. There doesn't seem to be a direct African American connection to Earl Scruggs. In other words, I'm not sure that Earl heard an African-American, you know, banjo player playing in three finger style. But when we look at classic banjo, uh, the music that began in the 1860s, a finger picked style that was notated, very popular, mirrored the ragtime era of the 1890s. That music does have uh, an African-American influence. Scott Joplin's uh, father, I believe, played the five string banjo probably in a style somewhat like this. And, and then of course, Charlie Poole, the old time musician from North Carolina that Earl most certainly heard was, a, was influenced by classic banjo. So these things come uh, in various steps and, and the transmission gets more and more complicated as we go down through the generations. That's what makes it great. That's what makes it really beautiful and wonderful. And again, this current moment is is a beautiful one where where um, we've got um, someone like Rhiannon Giddens telling it like it like it is, and and uh, to a new audience. And she is drawing on a lot of the work that folklorists did 
back when I was doing my research, not, she's not drawing on my work, but I, I, I was reading the same things that she's been reading more recently. I was reading a lot of those books way back when I was doing my graduate work in the late 1980s and early 1990s. So, so we're at a great moment right now, I think. Yeah. Well, the, yeah, the history of banjo sure is, you know, deeper than people give it, um, give it credit for, um, Changing subjects, kind of. You've had such a, you've had a successful career playing the banjo as an, you know, an instrumentalist, and you know, you aren't, you aren't, uh, you know, a, a vocalist. Um, you might, I'm not sure if you sing now and then, but I don't I haven't. I do, yeah. You, but, but I haven't. Um, for the most part, you, I, I think of you as an instrumentalist. Yes. And, um, and do you have any recommendations for you? for young musicians, young instrumental musicians on having a, a full-time career. Um, it, Cause it can be a tricky thing, not being, especially, you know, not being a singer or if you aren't a, like a, you know, a definite songwriter as well, you, you're, you're an instrumental player. Um, how would you, how would you suggest people you've, you've done it a lot with educational materials, I know, and, and a lot of other, you know, teaching in various aspects, but how right. would you suggest people going through, you know, the expanding a career as going down that route? Yes. Thank you. What a deep question that is. Um, my own biography has, has, uh, moved back and forth from an academic perspective to a performance perspective and, and teaching has always been in there. Um, and uh, I think that, boy, I, I have to, my brain is whirring here. If, if I was a Macintosh computer screen, that would be the little rainbow whir <laughs> whirring around and around because I'm thinking about young people that might be watching this. Um, I think a career solely playing the banjo is rare and, and, uh, and, Maybe that's for very good reason. Uh, and, but, but even if you look at um, the careers of some of the folks that we would consider to be really successful, they might have their own recording studios, right? Or they run a record label like Allison Brown uh, mm -hmm. or a booking agency. In my case, I have um, done a, a lot of teaching uh, I love group workshops and weekend long camps. I've, I've done hundreds of those over 30 years and I'm now producing them myself. And I really enjoy that. And a lot of my camps are online. They're almost exclusively online right now. And I love that. And, and, um, I, oh my gosh, what do I say? Um, uh, I tell younger musicians that this is the time of your life to practice as much as you can because you don't have as much time later on. So if, um, if you're 12, you know, and you want to be playing all the time, hopefully your home situation will allow you to do that. 16, 20, every wonderful musician that I've ever known has gone through a period of their lives where they practiced intensely for some amount of time, four hours to six hours, you know, almost every day or more. Jens Kruger talks about practicing 16 hours a day. There are only certain stages of your life that you can do that. As you get older, we get commitments uh, in our lives and we get married, we have kids. And then suddenly, you know, not only do we have greater financial obligations, but we don't have as much time. Uh, and so I have always encouraged younger musicians, if you have the opportunity to go to college and do something you can, if you can go to one of the, the schools that has a music program, that's great, but also take courses in another field. Uh, Belmont offers music education in business, you know, biz music business education. But for me, I majored uh, in anthropology and religion, and I did my bluegrass playing on the side. I still got to be a better musician through all of those years in college, but I came out with an undergraduate degree and I learned a lot and I grew a lot because I've read a lot uh, in, in, in about life. And, and so um, I would encourage younger musicians to play as much as possible, set your goals as high as you can, but it's good to have, I think, a plan B. And, and my interests have always been very broad, however. So I'm interested in, in, in social anthropology. I'm interested in, in comparative religion and, and, uh, and many other things, U.S. history. 
um, um, linguistics, uh, so forth and so on. And so, um, so most musicians, even older generations that we would consider to be, you know, our heroes had considerable income coming in from places other than just the money they made from playing banjo on a stage. Uh, so for instance, uh, the Scruggs family invested in real estate and, uh, and much of the music, much of their income came from, from, from that. And uh, so the other thing I would advise for younger musicians is, and I know, boy, you know, it took me a long time to, to listen to this, but if you can, you know, have good health insurance and get your retirement accounts going so that when you end up to be my age, you've got something saved um, so that you have more choices in life rather than fewer choices. And then the other piece of advice that I offer people, we, I was just talking about this with the great guitar player, Robert, Robert Bolin, who was here in New Mexico over the weekend, is um, with my own career, um, one choice led to another, led to another, and I went down the path of educational materials and workshops and camps. I grew to love that more and more. And I love intensely these days teaching people, uh, especially in group situations, but I also teach one-on-one -on -one students and I love that as well. I'm at the point in my life now where if I wanna get interested in something else to do with music or the banjo, I, I don't want it to be way out here on the other side that's not related to my core my core things that I'm interested in that I've made a professional living in. So if for some reason I wanted to um, start doing uh, electric banjo with trance electronic music backup, like Chris Pandolfi has been doing, <laughs> exactly. uh, he, you know, I, I'm not going to do that. I just don't have the time. <laughs> so, so, you know, my future projects, I try to keep in the same line as what I've been doing before, because because I I, I don't ha I don't have the time. I actually don't want to necessarily invest the time in something that's totally totally different at this point. So, you know, the projects that I have on the burner right now, a Christmas instructional video from Homespun that's geared towards beginners and low intermediate players. That's already available, and so. Um, the Banjo in America DVD and CD package is coming out. I've got a new bluegrass album coming out with uh, Daryl Anger and John Reichman, Chad Manning, Sharon Gilchrist, and Jim Nunley, and my wife, Babby. That'll be coming out next year, but that sound, you know, the, the approach is very similar to the other records that I've had. The one project that I do have in the works that will be a big one is I would, I would love to assemble an exercise book like the Patterns for Jazz book that a player could use forever you know so when i'm gone there'll be something that somebody 50 years might reference to learn you know what happens with roll patterns what happens with single string scales and positions and melodic and there isn't one place that you can go for that so i'm going to be spending the next couple of years doing that and i'm really excited about the jd crow project as well and again that that is within my core constituencies i guess is what i could call it and and playing to my strengths so i guess there's some advice there somewhere um I'm amazed how just... with each succeeding generation, you know, the young, younger kids coming along and playing now, they have access to YouTube and their primary influences are different than mine. They're Bela Fleck, you know, and Noam Pakelny and people like that. And so their starting place is that place. And it's exciting to see where it might go, you know, from, from there. Well, you, you have so many interests, it's, it's, but you, you seem to not, spread yourself too thin. You seem to somehow stay focused on and get things completed, which is uh, very, uh, you know, I respect you a lot for that. Thank, thank you for that. Uh, what I'm thinking about is that I am nine months overdue on a book that I'm writing with Chris and Scott Benson, and she's finished her part. <laughs> it's going to be it's called 25 Great Bluegrass Banjo Solos, and we're profiling 25 players. And I'm going to have my part done in a month if you're listening, Hal Leonard and Kristen, uh, I'm working on it right now, but I don't get everything done in time, that's for sure. And when I wrote those For Dummies books, I pulled a lot of all-nighters. Uh, it reminded me of being back in college again, uh, just to meet those deadlines. So I, I have to still work at it. The other thing, and I'll, you know, another kind of gem of wisdom, I've been doing this, I'm lucky, I've been doing it for a really long time, you know, professional player for 45 years. And so that's a long time to explore all these different areas. And 
I've, I never really have been locked into a touring situation that's kept me away from home for many days a year. Um, I've been, you know, I, I played with the group Dry Branch Fire Squad, the traditional band in the 1990s. I had my own band in the 1980s, but, but I would very rarely be home for long, be away from home for long periods of time. And that, you know, that having a, a, a professional touring schedule where I could go out on weekends and come back, you know, you know, on Monday or Tuesday, teach during that, you know, work on book projects and then go out again the next weekend or the weekend after that's allowed me to get some of these things done. I, I haven't put all my eggs in one basket, which I guess if we were to be very uh, pithy with, with your question, just my advice might be, don't put your eggs in one basket <laughs> <laughs> because you and I have lived through this period, you know, musicians, and I'm not telling anyone anything that we don't already know, we used to rely on income from CDs. And as a teacher, I used to rely on income from DVDs. And, and literally that, you know, what a band could make on, on CD sales might equal what they get paid to play at a, a show. And, and for me going to a banjo camp, selling things like DVDs, that allowed me to, to earn enough money to come home. We don't have those things anymore. But what we do have are these online resources. And, and, and in my own experience, people have been very generous during COVID uh, for, you know, I've done four or five workshops online for free, just asking for donations. And we did the, uh, every year I do something called the California banjo extravaganza on the West coast. And we did that virtually last year with uh, Catherine Bowness and Allison DeGroote. People were very, very generous. And uh, <laughs> this year we hope to do it in person uh, in California, by the way. Uh, but, but, um, and we will, but at any rate, um, there we go. <laughs> well, I know you have another banjo there. Do you want to play another tune? Got two more. Um, All right. I referenced classic style. So you're getting really a, cla a crash course here in banjo history. Um, one really great book, a couple of great books for those who are interested in exploring a topic more. One is called Sinful Tunes and Spirituals by a librarian named Dina Epstein, who scoured primary sources uh, for uh, mentions of African American culture in, in Africa, African culture, of course, and then in America. And there is much information about the banjo in her book. And then another book that was written um, as a dissertation uh, published by the University of Illinois is written by a Smithsonian Institution uh, a professional named Karen Lin, L-I-N-N. -N, and that book is called That Half Barbaric Twang, The Banjo in American Popular Culture. And that gives you a good overview of the complete history of, of the instrument. And any history of the banjo will cover, I'm going to go get my third banjo here and hopefully not bring everything crashing down in Chevy Chase style. Um, beginning in 1865, a player named Frank B. Converse, uh, who had written instructional manuals, wrote, uh, published an instructional manual with a new way of playing the banjo for the, its time called the guitar style. And the guitar had already moved into American culture in the 1850s, uh, and it was finger picked or sometimes called up picking. And so when this way of playing, uh, became translated to the banjo. And then ragtime came in in the late 1890s with Scott Joplin and the other Midwestern African-American composers. Um, classic banjo, this notated written style beginning in the 1860s, extending through the first decades of the 20th century, um, really redefined the banjo for those people who were playing from written sources. Not everybody had access to, to this, this way of playing. I'm playing on a 1917 Vega White Lady number no. seven, restored by Joe Conkley of Elderly Instruments. And I'm not sure really, we got a lot of glare here, but this is a fancy, fancy banjo with a carved heel. And uh, this would have been uh, kind of a uh, status symbol in the Victorian home, kind of like the, the 105 inch flat screen TV. Much of the literature song material uh, is, it sounds a lot like ragtime or very, very early cartoon music is another way to think about it. And uh, you can actually go online and listen to recordings from players such as Joe Morley and Vess Osman. These are cylinder recordings and it's really opening a door to a whole different approach to rhythm and sound. The banjos on these early recordings are very brittle sounding and the rhythms are very, um, well, what we would call is kind of, kind of stilted really. 
but it was viewed as very, very hot music for the day. I'll play a tune that is a beginner's piece. Again, I'm no expert on these styles. Called a ragtime episode. Again, so ragtime being the most popular American music in the late 1890s through the first decades of the 20th century. Written by a banjo player named Paul Eno, who also directed a dance orchestra in New York. So there we go. So here we go, a ragtime episode. That was fantastic. I love that. Thank you. It's great stuff. We have a comment from from Ken Carlson. It's not a question, but but we could get a question kind of out of it. He said, I wish I was that relaxed and smiling while I played. It makes it so much more enjoyable to watch. Do you have any tips on playing relaxed, like, you know, to get to that point where you can play relaxed and smile? Yeah. Uh <laughs> Have dogs barking in the background. That helps. Uh, um, um, well, a number of levels. You need to have. You need to practice the material enough so you're comfortable with it. And and but then as part of of my practice routine, uh, I do practice. You know, especially when I'm first starting out, trying to play relaxed. And 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 for me, that begins with the neck and the shoulders, and and working down the arms. And sometimes, if you know, I wouldn't do this. Um, in a real concert, but here I am doing it for daring banjos is just shaking my hands out <laughs> and just really, really comfortable. And then when you start to play, really, I try to focus the energy on the fingers. So in other words, not my shoulder, you know, there's a stereotype of a bluegrass player, you know, playing really fast and hard driving with a raised shoulder like this. And, and just really try to maintain that relaxation and letting the, letting the, um, the energy come from the ends of the fingers. And, um, uh, also, to I think a lot about about really great tone, uh, and that sometimes means not really having to play very loudly. So depending upon the setting, whether it's a band setting, uh, you sometimes have to play a lot louder with a band. But if I'm playing by myself and playing in concert, I don't have to necessarily play that loudly. And uh, and and it's something that I practice or I think about all the time even in the middle of the song. And in terms of having fun, I decided, you know, 
quite a long time ago that if you can't have fun while you're doing this, you shouldn't be doing it. And it's a tremendous gift for me, a gift that comes to me to be able to share this with others. And if other people enjoy it, then, then, you know, my, my work is fulfilled and the reasons for doing it are, are good. Um, I remember reading uh, from some, and someone who's listening will have to like, I'm, this is a well-known quote, but you know, folks said, when, when I used to do a solo show, I, I put a lot of my energy into, you know, just trying to impress people with how well I played. But I later learned, and I wish I'd learned it long before, is that people wanted to be entertained and they wanted to feel good. And so I, I, my, what I think about now as a performer is, is making people feel good and making them feel happy. And that to me is more important than, than showing off a particular technical expertise or compositional ability or anything like that. If I can make people feel good, then that's what I'm here to do. Yeah. We, um, we have another question by, uh, by Randy, Randy Imhoff. He's saying, do you have any advice for those of us who are older and are just taking up the banjo? We may not want to be professional, but we want to learn to play well. Yes. What I do with my students, but, you know, uh, here's a secret. Hey, students, you could do this on your own. You don't need me, uh, is, is to, or any teacher, but is to um, lay out, you know, if you were working a, a job at a business, you would have a business plan, right? I used to work for a nonprofit, the Bluegrass Museum, and we had a long range plan. Well, when we think about um, our music, musical journey, musical adventure, let's set goals. Let's set short term, medium term range and long range goals. So you could think about what gives you the most pleasure about playing the banjo? Where would you like to be in one or two years? And, and write that down. It's important to write these things down. Then that plays into your medium range goals, which could be three to six months. So for instance, let's say a, a, a shared goal that many musicians uh, who are learning the banjo have is to play with a band or play or be competent in a jam. Let's, let's leave it at that first. And so, so there are a lot of elements that one needs to, to, to learn in order to feel comfortable in a jam. And uh, there's repertoire, there's technique, there's learning how to accompany others, and then learning repertoire that you can teach others in a jam session. And then also learning the unwritten, the unspoken language of, of jam etiquette. And, and uh, you can attend jams and attend jam classes, but also is, if, if that was my goal, then when I'm working on something at home or practicing something, I might, I've got good reason to learn where my chords are up the neck, which doesn't necessarily happen if you're just opening a songbook and learning one song after the other. Uh, also, another thing that you might do if your goal is to, you know, be comfortable, say, in a slow jam is uh, go to the slow jam in your area or, or access a list of songs that tend to get played. Then that will guide you in what to learn. Um, you don't want to learn something that is too difficult for you, uh, and and but you do want to learn things that commonly get played in jam sessions. And and so as you immerse yourself in this, this is where a, a teacher or a a friend with more experience can help guide you with this in terms of of the songs that you can learn and the the variety of techniques that you need in order to be comfortable in a jam. And then the medium range goals play into the shorter range goals, which might be from lesson to lesson. And so in my own teaching, we learn repertoire, we learn technique, we learn licks, but also we learn backup for every song. Uh, we learn to play in different keys and, um, and, uh, and in order to gain all of the skills that one might, might utilize in order to feel comfortable in jams. I think a real challenge for players uh, who are older is the speed issue. And that is a big challenge. And, and it's still possible to have a lot of fun with the instrument, however. And this is where going to a regular jam can be very uh, disheartening because oftentimes in normal jams, songs are played very fast. And, and sometimes songs that are hard for us as banjo players, like Whiskey Before Breakfast, or Liberty or Soldier's Joy are very hard for us as banjo players. Um, and so if you can find a slow jam, I am a believer in, 
in uh, you know letting the speed come through accumulated practice of sounding good and being relaxed rather than playing too fast and not sounding good and not being able to execute properly. It can take a while. Uh, I normally tell my students who are brand new to banjo that you ought to try to give it two and a half to four years uh, of, of, of guided study um, to get to these various places where you could start to feel comfortable in a jam. Good advice. Very good advice. Um, we're, we're, we've passed the top of the hour, but I do want to talk about, well, quickly, one quick question. It's a little off topic, but Clay King is saying he's been struggling with trigger finger impacting. Have, have you had any, heard of any ways to help that out? Yes. Have you I've ever had that issue. And I'm interested in knowing which finger in which hand, uh, but but that can be that can be you know that comes down to an independence of control, and usually it's a right hand issue for people, and that plays into technique, and and um, and you know I my own way of teaching this and presenting it is fairly traditional, old school, which having some degree of arch in the wrist, trying to to keep both of these fingers anchored, but if almost everyone has trouble keeping them both anchored. So at first you can anchor just the ring fingers. What I is kind of a new approach if you're having trouble with this. Uh, of course, there are many great players who only anchor with one finger, so it's not essential. Uh, and then trying to play with relaxation. And it, you know, oftentimes I think trigger figure can be, it's, it's a result of tension of some kind, but it can be other things too. And sometimes it's, it's a problem that we can't overcome uh, I hope that's not the case with this individual. And we just continue to play anyway, and it gets better. So it, I would need more information for specific advice, but I think a lot of it might come down to relaxation and trying to be, have an economical movement with your fingers of your right hand. He says, Clay says it is the left hand ring finger. So left hand like ring finger. Hand. And so a trigger finger would mean, help me here, David, and, and he'll chime in again, just the finger is moving out, right? Well, I might maybe, you know, I've had it in my thumb before um, where, where it's, uh, I have a tightness in the, it's clicking um, in the, in the, in the tendon at the knuckle. I had it. Let me, once in my thumb. let me give you a quick, everybody, a quick crash course in what I do with the left hand. And this is my own personal way of doing it. It's not what Earl Scruggs did. It's not what Charlie Cushman does, you know, but this might be a good place to start is if we, and I've got my classic banjo here, but this would apply for anything. I like to take the pad of the thumb and rest it on the top hemisphere of the neck of the banjo and relax the shoulder and relax the elbow in. You see how as we relax the, and let me get a little bit more of a bluegrass position here. As you relax the elbow in, the hand comes forward. And then I find my fretting positions this way. Sometimes people will go like this, right? We've seen this a lot where the thumb is, is really in the back of the neck. I can't quite quite get into position here with with the the set we have here, and and then the palm the the wrist is bent down, but that makes the fingers go up, and then we have to crank the fingers down. That's a lot of tension in my mind. So of course there are times where we're playing kind of spread out chords that we have to do this. But my go to position is really based on the relaxed position of the hand with the pad of the thumb on the top of the neck and then just let the elbow be totally loose, and then I come in. Maybe that might help as well. Try it and see. Uh, if you're in like this, which is what a lot of players do, that might be causing issues, but if you're like this too, that might really be contributing to the trigger figure. So try it and see. That's that's great information, because for you know a lot of people can, you know, with practice, a lot of practicing, then end up with some in wrong positioning if the hand can end up with some tendonitis issues and different right. issues. Right. I try to have people play based on their, on what with in both hands, both arms, whatever is the most relaxed state for them. That's where we start. And I think, you know, you look at Earl Scruggs and Don Reno and JD Crow and all these great players, they look really relaxed, right? Bela Fleck, you know, everybody, it looks like they're falling off a log and their work, you know, and all those players have different hand positions, Allison Brown, uh, Gina Furtado, but they are relaxed. And so I think that's the key. It, it's not necessarily that we all do the same thing, but we find what works for us. And as a teacher, I'm there to help you. I mean, it's kind of an amorphous thing to tell a student, oh, just find what works for you. But, but a good teacher can help you find that uh, too, yeah. even remotely. <laughs> well, 
Bill, I could keep keep chatting all day with you. You're such, you know, you're so, you know, knowledgeable on so many different subjects of of the instrument and the music. But before we go, I do want to talk about some some things you have coming up. I know you have a a workshop coming up with Ron Block and Kristen Scott Benson on backup banjo, and then you also have a um, a bluegrass banjo Christmas instruction video coming up. Yes, the, the Christmas video is available and from Homespun, so homespunmusic.com. They're all downloads now. They don't make, uh, they don't make uh, DVDs anymore. And we, um, I teach seven tunes. There's a, 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 and I also teach uh, approaches to accompanying Christmas songs, which can be kind of tricky because it's not all bluegrass or old time. And the project has a great deal in it for beginning level players, but there's also a couple of advanced tunes as well. So there's a wide variety of material. You, when you purchase, you get the download and then they send you the PDF file of all the tabs. And you can watch a, a seven minute preview on the web, on the Homespun site. So that's available. And the October 17th workshop is online via Zoom from noon to six uh, Eastern time on Bluegrass Backup in all its way, shape, and form with Kristen Scott Benson, Ron Block, and myself. And, you know, Kristen and Ron are great. And I know you've had Kristen on the show. She's a wonderful, wonderful teacher who can break things apart and simplify. And she's going to take a Graskell's recording um, of a Flatten Scruggs song called He Took Your Place with the banjo and the vocal out. I mean, the vocal is out and the banjo is up. So you and she's going to analyze what she plays from the beginning of the song to the end, and everybody will have access to those MP3s. And she's going to teach in the process some down the neck approaches, along with some up the neck uh, kinds of techniques. And then I'm going to build from that and show how we can use some basic backup techniques to play in different keys. And then Ron Block is going to talk about a philosophy of backup. And he will draw quite a bit on his experience with Allison Krauss and Union Station. What could be better than that? That's going to be incredible. And Ron, you know, is very, he's our banjo philosopher. He's a very deep thinker. And I've, I've heard him talk about the role of the banjo in the band before. And, and it's really, it will open up your mind in so many ways to, as he, as he relates his way of thinking about what the role of the banjo is in, in the band. So we're gonna have a really varied afternoon. There'll be time for questions. Uh, students will have access to all of the sessions after they're over. They'll be put up on YouTube and available via private links. And you'll have access to the tablatures forever as well if you can't make us live on October 17th. And if you're interested in that, you can email me uh, for more information. I've got a, a, a sheet with all the info. Bill at BillEvansBanjo.com is the email. Bill at BillEvansBanjo.com. And I can get you signed up. I'd love for everybody to join us. It's going to be really a good one. And, I, and these, you know, I think the combination of teachers is going to be great because we each approach the topic in a, in a different way. That sounds like a fantastic workshop. So, yeah. Thanks. But, um, I, I hope I can join too. Um, well, um, I'm going to ask you to play us out um, as, as we go out. But, but right before we go, I just want to announce um, next week. Thank you, everybody, for, for tuning in again. Thanks, thanks, Bill, for, for being here and sharing, you know, playing for us and sharing your knowledge with us. And, You're welcome. Um, and, and, but for everybody, next week, we have a next Wednesday, we have a very special Deering Live coming up. Um, we'll, we'll be announcing some more information um, very soon. Check your email box. Check your the social media channels, uh, the Deering social media channels, and uh, but definitely, definitely be prepared to tune in next next week. Um, it should it's going to be a very good one. Um, Bill, do you want to play us out? And I've what, got what my, banjo is uh, that my that you have? You... Julia Bell banjo. All right, there and I go. love this instrument. I used to try to uh, to take a bluegrass banjo and just put heavier gauge strings on it and tune it down. It never worked. And there's a lot of features about this instrument that are really ideal, the way that it's set up by Deering to accommodate the lower, the lower pitch. I've got it tuned to E. I'll play a tune called Petersburg Gal from that Bill Evans Plays Banjo album. And again, thanks everybody for listening. It's been a joy to be with you. Check me out at BillEvansBanjo.com. Stay in touch. And I hope to see you at one of these workshops. Petersburg Gal.
Bye.